Sure, let's get quick reaction from all of our analysts and our reporters. Fareed Zakaria, you listened very carefully. You spoke for almost 40 minutes. Uh, what did you think? I thought in the main theme, he really st uh, stuck to his guns, which was it was populist, nationalist, protectionist. You know, as I, I will look after America first. Uh, the trade deals were the center of it. That was all familiar. The, the, when he expanded, it was sort of rambling to the point of being incoherent. I mean, he, he, you know, he contradicted himself several times. It struck me. He said, we're going to get out of nation building, but we are going to create stability. Well, how do you do that? You get out of nation building in Afghanistan, you'll get more instability. You got out of nation building in Iraq, you got more instability. He said, the allies can rely on us, but we will be completely unpredictable. He said, we will spend what it takes to rebuild the military, but we're going to pay down the debt. Um, we're going to spread Western civilization, but we're not going to spread democracy. And he ended with a truly bizarre uh, statement about the greatest problem in the world is that we have too many weapons. And once again, a, a strange place where you might find that he and Bernie Sanders uh, are one. So I thought that when he tried to flesh out an actual foreign policy, uh, it was pretty incoherent. He was very strong on his protectionism, anti-trade, uh, American unilateralism. He was very strong on attacking the, uh, the Obama-Clinton uh, legacy. And as you say, really, that's mostly the Bush legacy when he talks about the trillions of dollars spent trying to nation-build in the Middle East. That's the Iraq war. That's the Afghanistan war, both of which were initiated by President Bush. Um, so I, I, I don't know that it's going to convince anyone. It certainly didn't strike me as a, uh, a careful, analytic laying out of a Trump foreign policy. Mike Rogers, you're the former chairman of the House Intelligence Committee. What was your reaction? Uh, a bit of the same. It was not exactly coherent. I think he was trying to go do three things in this speech. Talk to the establishment, national security type Republicans to say, hey, listen, I can be presidential. But then he threw a lot of red meat for the base. He took care of that going into states like Indiana. He, threw the, he mentioned Benghazi in a national foreign policy speech. A little odd. And then lastly, he did a, in Michigan, we'd call it putting Bondo on the car, trying to keep that thing together uh, by repairing. I, and the biggest part I noticed was his NATO, trying to repair his remarks on NATO about being irrelevant. He was basically going back. It is a common theme of we, we need to get all the NATO nations paying at that 2% GDP. And I'm going to bring them in a room and I'm going to tell them if they don't we won't play along. And I think that covered both ends of that spectrum. So the NATO history. mission is outdated, uh, but it does have an opportunity to rethink its mission. Let's go overseas to London. Nick Robertson, uh, I know people all over the world are watching. Uh, they're, they're very anxious to hear what he said. Uh, he basically said it, and I want to get your reaction, that the administration's policy uh, on Egypt, on Syria, on Libya, on Iraq has been a total disaster. Maybe well-intentioned, but things turned out to be a disaster. Yeah, and I think a lot of uh, what we heard there, generally, you could say, if painting this with broad brushstrokes, will warm him and endear him, despite his statements that have really riled people in the Middle East about not letting Muslims into the United States and casting some of the countries there as sponsors of terrorism, some of the Sunni countries, that is. I think you will find a warming to uh, a good part of his rhetoric when he talks about Iran taking advantage in Iraq, the need to deal with Iran. Um, this is something that's going to warm him to the Saudis, to uh, their Gulf allies. I think when you look at Europe here, however, I think there's the, 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 things in there that will cause the Europeans to worry, not just that there's going to be a demand that they make that 2% uh, GDP uh, spend on NATO and the type of e equipment that they need to, to spend it on. Big, big ticket equipment is what the Obama administration has talked about. So uh, not just that, but the fact that he's talking here about really um, perhaps uh, looking at the relationship with Russia. What does that mean in Europe? Does that mean he is going to blink and forget about what's happened in Ukraine and what's happened in Crimea? That's what the European nations are going to worry about. You know, they see, uh, they see their alliance with the United States as being critical to their defense there. You have uh, just in Munich. Uh, a few months ago, uh, General Philip Breedlove, the U.S. military commander of NATO, saying that Russia is the biggest threat right now that we see the United States sees. So um, the Europeans are going to worry uh, that there might be a shift away from that kind of vision on what the compromises might be. So I think you'll see a worry in Europe and perhaps a warming to him a little 
in the Middle East, Wolf. Yeah, I, I suspect uh, the Saudis probably were very happy what he had to say about Iran. I assume the Israelis would also be very happy what he had to say about uh, Iran as well. Some of the Gulf states, the United Arab Emirates, uh, Bahrain, and some other countries as well. Uh, Nick Payton Walsh, you're there in the Middle East for us. You're joining us now live from Beirut. Uh, let's talk about what he suggested, that the policies of the Bush administration and now the Obama administration over the past seven and a half years uh, in Iraq, in Syria, have uh, basically laid the groundwork for the establishment, the creation of ISIS and this threat that now exists in the region and outside of the region. You, you cover that story for us. What did you think? Well, it's interesting. I mean, his grasp of Middle Eastern history seems to sort of stop in about 2000, then pick up again in about 2008. If you look uh, at why he thinks ISIS came into being, it's because Obama wasn't strong enough. Yes, there's an argument that perhaps a continued U.S. military investment or presence in Iraq could have helped the country, perhaps weather the arrival of ISIS. But remember, ISIS came into fruition as the Islamic State of Iraq during the insurgency against the American presence, against uh, American presence that was divided and implemented by George W. Bush uh, between, uh, as we well know, after 2003 and 2008 when he left the presidency. So uh, there's a great deal of desire to say that it's basically Obama's weakness that has caused us to be in the state where ISIS came into existence, completely failing to look at the fact that actually they sprang out of a Sunni insurgency uh, against the American there. Some other interesting points he had to make too, suggesting that in fact ISIS in Libya now are quote making millions by selling oil they've got their hands onto to parts of Libya. Now uh, that's a huge exaggeration to say the best. ISIS's current tactic is to disrupt the Libyan oil system. They've scared some platforms out of existence or operation. They've taken control of others. They may be selling some oil on the black market, but it's certainly not a million strong daily trade. And it's the black market, definitely. It's a concern. But he went on to say that the U.S. is doing nothing about it. Well, that's not true. We do know special forces are getting involved there. We do know there's a lot of surveillance over that country, and there have been U.S. strikes there, too. So a great simplification. But but also one very dismissive uh, take on the entire Arab Spring, where he basically said that many of the countries involved were countries that, quote, had no interest in becoming democracies. Well, we saw ourselves, the great groundswell of people in the streets demanding change. Yes, it did not turn out the way that people had hoped, and perhaps history will say Barack Obama should have been more callous in backing Hosni Mubarak, perhaps in power there. But frankly, to suggest that people weren't interested in democracy is a slight simplification. And one other quote really stuck out at me, uh, Fareed's already mentioned it, but to say, the power of weaponry is the single biggest problem we have in the world today. Well, that to some degree was staggering because you may argue much of the detente in the world now is because of nuclear weapons held by larger states. Would a whole series of much smaller weapons around the world make the world a safer place? It was somewhat confusing and I think somewhat emblematic of the simplification here uh, and really too how we couldn't bridge the contradiction between saying we're going to be less involved as a power and only fight when we know we can win, victory with a capital V, he said, while at the same time to not necessarily put ourselves out on the front line as much before. So a huge uh, confusion, I thought, between wanting to say America is going to get more involved around the world and bring peace, bring peace to the world, he said, while at the same time to not extend itself further than necessarily needs to, or perhaps even withdraw at times and get up to do the fighting for it. Well, no. He said the military option would be the last option, the very last option. He would want diplomacy, he want economic power, all sorts of things before the U.S. committed.